In this video, we're going to talk about something that could definitely happen to you that you really should try to avoid. We're going to learn from a fascinating episode from history where the smartest people were all gathered together to plan an action. They came up with a brilliant and bold plan that they then put into action and it failed almost instantly for multiple obvious reasons. And as it began to crumble, they could only look at what was happening and ask, what on earth were we thinking? Let's have a look. I first came across the phenomenon that we're going to talk about in this video when I was dealing with people in businesses. The sort of businesses that go out their way to hire the smartest people in the room because they need to do the right thing. And then some of whom have then gone on to do incredibly stupid things that damage the company in the public. Seriously, what were they thinking territory? Like this advert for Ford, which used the controversial Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi to illustrate how ample the boot space was in this particular car. Because nothing screams family car quite like a trio of kidnapped, scantily clad women. Or indeed this one that illustrated what a hearty meal this Burger King sandwich might be. The question of what they were thinking isn't much in doubt. How could they be that dumb is more to the point. And the answer to that question in both cases was unquestionably because it was an ad agency team full of lads who know that a bit of spark makes an advert memorable and none of whom thought that there was anything so wrong with such imagery that it went from attention grabbing, which is what they wanted, to outright stupid, which is what it actually was. A tight knit group of almost certainly highly intelligent and talented people who completely missed any counterfactuals that might challenge what they thought to be a great idea. And this was a situation that companies identified as the thing we now call groupthink. At the time, it was used as an argument for diversity in businesses. Now, people have different ideas about what that phrase means, but in this context, it meant the importance of having some diversity of opinion and experience in the room, particularly in a creative agency. But at least the consequences in those cases was just you know, corporate embarrassment and some damage control, and of course, some amusement at their expense, which is never a bad thing. Groupthink in other contexts, though, can be more damaging and even deadly, as evidenced by one of the classic histories of massive government failure that falls under this category. Soon after John F. Kennedy was elected as US president, he was asked if he wanted to proceed with a plan put in motion by his predecessor, Eisenhower, to spark a revolt against the recently installed communist regime of Fidel Castro in Cuba. Kennedy pulled together a large team of brilliant advisors, nearly 50 of them. They approved a plan where around 1,200 Cuban exiles who had been working with the CIA would storm the beachhead at Bahia de Cochinos and from there they would march on Havana. Obviously, this would then lead the Cuban people to be inspired to rise up and depose the communist interlopers. It seemed to the team that this was a bold and brave plan, one that would succeed because of its audacity and its daring, which isn't quite how it played out. The 1,200 Cuban exiles landed on the beach, only to be met by 20,000 Cuban soldiers. The American fighter planes and naval destroyers that were supposed to provide support, they were notable by their absence when they were most needed. And the troops were left with neither ammunition nor any way to escape the trap they'd willingly thrust themselves into. Most of them were taken prisoner, the rest were killed. After the event, Kennedy said this, There were 50 or so of us, presumably the most experienced and smartest people that we could get. But five minutes after it began to fall in, we all looked at each other and asked, how could we have been so stupid? And that is the key question, because once he'd answered it, Kennedy was able to change how things were done to make sure that it wouldn't happen again. So first, what actually is Groupthink. I mean, it's hard to avoid if you don't know how it works. Is it really a thing or is it just a convenient label to slap onto anything that was organised by a group that turns out badly? The first study done on this was by Irving Janis, who said that there were eight symptoms that suggested groupthink, which fell under three types. Type one was overconfidence, and there were two symptoms of this. 
One was an illusion of invulnerability. Yes! I am invincible! Which created excessive optimism and encouraged risk-taking. In the corporate setting, an ad agency that's had several brilliant successes can easily buy into their own hubris and believe in their supreme quality. Kennedy had just won an election. He was seen as the bold face of a new era in politics. Very easy to buy into your own publicity there. The other was the unquestioned belief in the morality of the group, meaning that its members would pay little heed to the consequences of their actions. Is it really right to organise the invasion of another country? Obviously, if you're 100% confident that you are the forces of goodness confronting the self-evidently forces of evil, then you don't need to trouble me with your shades of grey. It doesn't say next to the skull, you know, yeah, we killed him, but trust us, this guy was horrid. The second type is to do with closed-mindedness. You have to actively repel the signals the world sends you that you might be on the wrong track. And there were two symptoms for this. One was rationalising away warnings that might challenge the group's assumptions. <laughs> A form of confirmation bias, in other words. You notice the things that confirm what you want to do and how wise it is, and the things that don't, well, you find reasons to explain why they don't apply in this case. And the other was stereotyping those who are opposed to you, dismissing them as weak or evil or biased or stupid or all four. Obviously, you don't feel you need to pay attention to people who falls into one of those categories. You're a fool. No weapon forged can stop me. And then the third type is pressures towards conformity. There are actually four symptoms for this one. One, individual self-censor opinions and ideas that deviate from the consensus. We say nothing. No one has to know. Two, there's an illusion of unanimity because silence is taken to indicate agreement. Three, there's a strong theme of loyalty to the group, such that any member who questions can be pressured and accused of being disloyal. But the one thing I will not stand for is disloyalty. And four, there are self-appointed members of the group who behave as so-called mind guards, actively shielding the group from dissenting information. It hams a lot more than you think, because people tend to like people who are similar to themselves in outlook and values, and so there's a natural tendency to end up with homogenous groups when you have a leader who indulges that tendency when they recruit their team. That can happen in politics every bit as much as it can anywhere else. And this was the point with the Bay of Pigs fiasco. There's no point having 50 advisors if none of them are going to push back against the suggested ideas. After the event, it emerged that a number of Kennedy's advisors had misgivings, but they never said anything. There was a mood in the room and they feared that they would be labelled as soft or undaring. Janice wrote about it like this, The group that made the basic decision to approve the invasion plan included some of the most intelligent men ever to participate in the councils of government. Yet all the major assumptions supporting the plan were so completely wrong that the venture began to founder at the outset and failed in its earlier stages. Those major assumptions included the following. One, that no one would know that the United States was responsible because they'd accept the CIA's cover story. That the Cuban Air Force was so ineffectual it would be knocked out of commission completely just before the invasion. That the Cuban exiles were highly motivated and capable of proceeding without US military support. That Castro's army was so weak it would be no problem to establish a defended beachhead. That the arrival of the exiles would trigger an uprising by the Cuban underground. And finally, that if it went wrong, the invaders would be able to retreat from the beach up into the mountains where they could defend themselves. A lovely idea, but physically just not actually possible from where they landed. A quick look at a map would have told them as much. Janice made this observation. When a cohesive group of executives is planning a campaign directed against a rival or enemy group, their discussions are likely to contain two themes which embody the groupthink tendency to regard the group as invulnerable. One, we are a strong group of good guys who will win in the end. And two, our opponents are weak, stupid, bad guys. The false assumptions, he said, all fitted into those two themes.
One of the advisors, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., suggested that it could easily have gone very differently. Had one senior advisor opposed the adventure, I believe Kennedy would have cancelled it. No one spoke against it. Now, why didn't Schlesinger do that himself? Because he'd encountered one of those mind guards in the form of the president's brother, Robert Kennedy. At a large birthday party for his wife, Robert Kennedy, who had been constantly informed about the Cuban invasion plan, took Schlesinger aside and asked him why he was opposed. The president's brother listened coldly and then said, you may be right, you may be wrong, but the president has made his mind up. Don't push it any further. Now is the time to help him all you can. This was how, in the name of loyalty to the leader, you ended up with a group pushing towards uniformity rather than information seeking, critical appraisal and debate. Now, to give Kennedy credit, he learned from the mistake. We all make mistakes, but only some of us choose to learn from them. He ordered a review of what went wrong and then in the light of the information that came out of that, he made four changes in how his top team would make key decisions. First, people had to step outside their own department specialism or perspective to view the problem as a sceptical generalist. Second, the group should encourage discussion with informal settings and with no formal agenda or protocol, particularly avoiding meetings that were structured around the high status group members. Third, the team should break into subgroups that could work on alternatives and then come back together. And fourth, they should meet at parts without Kennedy himself present so that people wouldn't be tempted to simply follow what he thought or what they thought he thought. So that's business and that's politics, two areas ripe for groupthink. What about in the field of science? I mean, you'd hope that scientists, being all brave sceptical types, it would be a field that was highly resistant to groupthink. And it may well be resistant to it, but it's certainly not immune to it. So in the book Science Fiction, Stuart Ritchie talks about the controversy around the amyloid cascade hypothesis for Alzheimer's disease. This was the suggestion that the cause of his terrible memory loss of that disease came from a buildup of amyloid beta protein, which formed in plaques in the brain. And it really matters. Alzheimer's disease is a terrible affliction. People watching helplessly as their parents or their grandparents are pulled away from them. And the maddening, frustrating thing was that while major leaps were being made in treatments for other age-related diseases, such as cancer and cardiovascular disease, there was only a string of failures from clinical trials of drugs to reduce the memory loss by breaking down the amyloids. And you probably guessed, that's because the amyloid hypothesis was just wrong. Targeting the amyloid didn't do anything to actually treat the disease. In this specific instance, it was described how the proponents of this hypothesis, many of whom were powerful, well-known professors, acted as a cabal, pushing against alternative hypotheses with nasty peer reviews and obstructing heterodox researchers from getting funding and tenure. The science writer Sharon Begley interviewed a number of researchers and concluded that this hadn't come about from any conscious decision or collusion on their parts. The researchers were simply so attached to the amyloid hypothesis in which they genuinely believed and which they thought was the best route towards progress in treatment for Alzheimer's that they developed a strong group bias. So you had people who acted as a relatively small cohesive group, susceptible therefore to groupthink. But their established orthodoxy was eventually overturned because ultimately science is driven by observation and results. Sooner or later you can't sustain that sort of mirage. But what about wider social phenomena? Because groupthink as a label gets applied to all sorts of things to wokeism or political correctness, to pro or anti-vaccines, or indeed by some people, to the entire phenomenon of global warming. These are not the same thing. Now, it's not the same as saying that there's nothing to see here. It's just that it's not the same dynamic. There are certainly some things in common. In a polarised society particularly, people most commonly get their opinions from their peer group than they do from critical evaluation of the evidence. The tendency to demonise and dismiss outgroups, that sadly is common to that wider phenomenon as well. The late journalist Christopher Booker, in his book on groupthink, observed this. We hear people casually using the word groupthink all over the place. 
usually to dismiss those with whose opinions they disagree. Ironically, he then proceeded in his book to arguably do precisely that, seeking to lay the charge at the wider political correctness movement, which we now refer to as wokeism, climate change and even Darwinism. There's much to be said on all of those topics, but you struggle to utilise the framework put forward by Janice to explain and dismiss them. So let's take climate change for an example. In his book, where he talked about climate change, Booker mostly talked about what he felt was a political movement that arose around the United Nations and Morris Strong and a handful of other people. He only referred to the science by reference to so-called climate gates. But if you're going to seek to damn the broader science of climate change as wholly the result of groupthink, you really are going to struggle. I mean, you might be able to maintain it on what one group of scientists did or didn't do with a piece of research or what one political process around the United Nations did or didn't do within a specific context. And that would then require you to be specific. What was specifically wrong and why it went wrong? There have been many thousands of published studies on the science going back to 1898. Some key ones vigorously debated and tested over a period of time. If something went wrong with that process, you would need to be a lot more realistic and precise about what and when and why. It's unlikely to be groupthink as we understand it here. It's not such a thing as possible. Many will look at some of the current humanities academic communities and note that their massive skew amongst its members to a particular left-wing perspective has arguably distorted the nature and quality of the work that it produces. And that's easy to do in some of those areas because they are works that often hinge on value statements. But it's harder to do that in the physical sciences. You can make the case that there are certain processes that can be questioned or attacked such as the attribution of individual weather events to human-caused climate change. But that's just a current debate around a relatively new proposition. It doesn't require groupthink. It's just something that we're currently discussing. Of course, these things are never just about the science. And there's a much stronger case to be made against some of the more extreme climate campaign activist groups. Unquestioned belief in the morality of the group. Check. Rationalising warnings that might challenge the group's assumptions, check. Stereotyping those who are opposed to the group as weak, evil, biased or stupid, a pretty big check. With a dismissive climate denier label applied to people who don't even remotely deny the validity of human-caused climate change, but have different ideas about what should be done about it. Within individual campaign groups, you might get some of the pressures towards uniformity, but more widely across the broader movement, not so much. I mean, people disagree vociferously about some of the details. Some of the well-known activist scientists share this, by the way. There's certainly a close-knit group around some of the best-known activist scientists that will dismiss out of hand with ad hominem attacks any propositions put forward by certain critics. And I personally would label that as a form of groupthink and something to be criticised. And it's why I like to look at some of those arguments that get out of hand dismissed with a clean slate approach that ignores who made the argument, but focuses instead on the quality of the argument and its supporting evidence. But even when it happens, it doesn't reflect on the thousands of different researchers working across multiple related fields that have come up with the basic proposition around global warming. Ultimately, if you dilute the concept of groupthink so massively to seek to use it to label large movements regardless of whether they're based on ideology, so wokeism or conservatism, scientific research, climate science and evolution, or political opinion, climate policy, if you're going to just call them all groupthink, it rather gets in the way of understanding and describing what they're really about. The phenomenon of groupthink is to explain the head-scratchingly bizarre moments when sensible people do something collectively so dumb that after the event you're left saying, what were they, or indeed, what were we thinking? Push it wider than that, it stops being a useful concept for analysis. In the case of the Bay of Pigs, it was useful enough that Kennedy could come up with some rules and procedures to avoid it happening again in the future. If you can't do that because you just disagree with an opinion, not the process that produced that opinion, then we're not talking about groupthink. But there is a lot 
that's going wildly wrong with our society. So if it's not the result of groupthink, then what is it? I did a video recently looking at some of those wider aspects called why we're in decline and what to do about it. You might want to have a look at that one next.